Hello, welcome back to chapter 11 of Momo. I hope you're enjoying it because I'm enjoying reading to it, it to you and it's helping me to feel more connected to people. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm missing seeing people through these interesting times and it's a nice way to to be connected to you. I hope you're doing okay. Are you sitting comfortably? What was that? Sorry, I can't hear you. You'll have to shout a bit louder. Okay. Yeah. For those sitting comfortably, I'm really glad. Yes. And I'm ready to start reading. And for those that are not sitting or standing or lying comfortably, then I hope that this brings you some comfort. It will. I know. <laughs> but I'm shivering and shaking from the bottom of my feet to the top oh, of my feet. Alright, you're going to have to stop talking so I can start reading. It's because I'm waiting for the next part of it, so... Even if you're really excited, you're going to have to stop now so I can start reading, because... I'm excited to read more as well. Okay. Innumerable figures were scurrying around the headquarters of the time-saving bank. A grey-lit labyrinth of passages and corridors passing on the latest news in agitated whispers. Every member of the directional board had been summoned to attend an extraordinary general meeting. <gasps> Some summarised that this portend, por, portended a dire emergency. Others that a new untapped source of time had been discovered. The directors were already closeted in the boardroom. They sat side by side at a conference table so long that it seemed to go on forever. Even with his steel-rimmed briefcase. Each with his steel Rimmed, rimmed briefcase, a small grey cigar, and a small grey cigar. They had removed their bowler hats for the occasion, and every last one of them had a bald head as grey as the rest of him. Their mood, if such boldness, bold, bloodless creatures could be said to have feeling at all, was universally dejected. The chairman rose from his place at the head of the long table. The hum of conversation died away, and two interminable, interminable rows of grey faces turned towards him. Gentlemen, he began, the situation is grave. I feel bound to acquaint you at once with the unpalatable but inescapable facts of the matter. Every available agent was assigned to hunt down the girl named Momo. This operation lasted a total of 6 hours, 13 minutes and 8 seconds. While engaged on it, all the said agents were inevitably compelled to neglect the true purpose of their existence, namely time gathering. To this, to this loss of revenue must be added to the time expended during the manhunt by our agents themselves. Accurate computations disclose that the sum of these two debits entries amount to three billion seven hundred and thirty eight million two hundred and fifty nine thousand one hundred and fourteen seconds that gentleman is more than a whole human lifetime i need hardly tell you that what such a deficit that what such a deficit means here he pointed dramatically at a huge steel door bristling with, with combination locks and safety devices set in the wall at the far end of the boardroom. Our reserves of time are not inexhaustible, gentlemen, he pursued in a louder voice. If the manhunt had, been paid, off, had paid off well and good, as it is, we wasted time to no purpose. The girl eluded us. There must be no repetition of this disastrous affair. I shall strongly oppose any more such time-consuming operation from now on. Time must be saved, no squandering. 
I would therefore urge you to frame your future plans accordingly. That is all I have to say, gentlemen. Thank you for your attention. He sat down, blowing out a dense cloud of smoke. Agitated whispers ran the length of the boardroom. Then, at the other end of the table, a second speaker rose to his feet. Every head turned in his direction. Gentlemen, he said, we all have the interest of the time-saving bank at heart. However, I find it quite unnecessary for us to view this affair with alarm, still less to regard it as a catastrophe. Nothing could be further from the truth. We all know that our reserves of time are so immense that our position would not be endangered even by a loss many <coughs> times greater <coughs> than the one we have just sustained. What is a human lifetime after all? By our standards, a mere pinprick. I fully agree that there must be with our chairman that there must be no repetition of this incident. On the other hand, nothing like it has ever happened before and the chances of it happen again are very remote. The chairman was right to reproach us all for allowing the girl to escape. On the other hand, our sole purpose was to render her harmless. And that we have successfully done. The creature has disappeared. She has fled beyond the borders of time. We are rid of her, in other words. Personally, I feel we have every reason to congratulate ourselves. The second speaker sat down with a, a complacent smile. The smattering of applause that greeted his remarks was cut short when a third speaker rose, this time from a seat halfway along the great table. I shall be brief, he said sourly. In my opinion, the last speaker's soothing words were thoroughly irresponsible. This Momo is a no ordinary child. We all know how she possesses powers capable of presenting a serious threat to us and our activities. The fact that no such incident has ever occurred before is no guarantee that it won't occur again. We must remain on our guard. We must not rest content until the child is in our power. Before, because only then can we be sure that she will never harm us again. Having managed to leave the realm of time, she may re-enter it at any moment, and she will, you mark my words. He sat down. The other directors winced and bowed their heads in silence. Gentlemen, said a fourth speaker, who was sitting across the table from the third, pardon me for being blunt, but we're dodging the issue. We must face the fact that an alien power has been meddling in our business. After carefully examining every aspect of the situation, I find that the odds against any creature crossing the borders of time, alive and unaided, are precisely 42 million to one. In other words, it's a near impossibility. Another buzz of agitation ran around the boardroom. Everything suggests the fourth speaker continued when the murmurs had subsided that someone helped the girl to elude us. You all know who I mean. The person in question titles himself Professor Horror. At the sound of his name, most of the men in grey flinched as if they had been struck. Others jumped to their feet, shouting and gesticulating. The fourth speaker raised his arm for silence. Gentlemen, he cried, a little self-control, if you please. I'm well aware that any mention of that name is, well, not quite proper. I utter it with extreme reluctance, I assure you. But we mustn't blind ourselves to the facts. If the girl received assistance from the aforesaid, uh, he must have had his reasons. 
and those reasons cannot be other than detrimental to us. In short, gentlemen, we must allow for the possibility that the aforesaid may now, may not only send the girl back, but arm her against us in some way. She will then be a mortal danger to us. We must therefore be prepared not merely to sacrifice another human lifetime or lifetimes. No, gentlemen. In the last resort, we must take everything we possess. I repeat, everything. Because if the worst happens, thrift could spell our destruction. I think you know what I'm getting at. The director's agitation mounted and they all started talking at once. A fifth speaker jumped on his chair and waved his arms wildly. Quiet! he bellowed. It's all very well for the last speaker to hint at a host of dire possibilities, but he obviously doesn't know how to deal with them himself. He says he must. we must be prepared for for any sacrifice well good we must stop at nothing well good we mustn't stint our resources well and good but these are just empty words let him tell us what practical steps to take none of us knows how the aforesaid will arm the girl against us we shall be confronted by a wholly unknown danger that's the problem we have to solve the boardroom was a roar now some of the directors shouted incomprehensibly. Others drummed on the table with their fists. Others buried their heads in their hands. All were overcome with panic. A sixth speaker strove hard to make himself heard above the din. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please! He kept repeating in a soothing voice. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please! Until, until peace was finally restored. I implore you to take a calm and common sense view of this matter. Even assuming that the girl comes back from the aforesaid, and even assuming that he arms her against us in some way, there would be absolutely no need for us to battle with her ourselves. We aren't particularly well equipped for such confrontation. As the lamentable fate of our late employee, agent number BLW553C, has, to amply, has amply demonstrated. But that won't be necessary. We have human accomplices in plenty. Gentlemen, provided we make discreet and skilful use of them, we shall be able to dispose of the girl Momo and the threat that she represents without ever having to intervene in person. Such a method of procedure would, I feel sure, be not only economical but safe and highly effective. A sigh of relief went up from the assembled throng. The directors found this a sensible suggestion and would probably have adopted it on the spot had not the floor been claimed by someone seated near the head of the table. Gentlemen, he began, we keep debating how best to get rid of the girl Momo. Our motive, let's be honest, is fear. But fear is a bad counsellor. I feel we're missing a golden opportunity, a unique opportunity. There's a saying, if you can't beat them, join them. Well, why shouldn't we persuade the girl to join us? Why not get her on our side? Hear, hear, cried the number, a number of voices. Go on! It seems clear, the seventh speaker continued, that this child has found her way to the aforesaid. In other words, she got there via the route that has eluded us for so long. If she can find it again, as she probably can with ease, she can lead us there. We shall then be able to deal with the aforesaid in our own way, very speedily too, I feel sure. Once that is done, we need, we need no longer toil at gathering time, by the, gathering time by the hour, minute and second. No, gentlemen, because we shall have captured mankind's whole store of time in a stroke, and possessing the whole of time means wielding absolute power. 
Just think, gentlemen, we shall have attained our goal, and all because of the girl you proposed to eliminate. A deathly hush had descended on the boardroom. That's all very well, protested someone, but you know it's impossible to lie to the girl. Remember what happened to Agent BLW553C? We'd all end up like him. Who said anything about lying to her? retorted the seventh speaker. We'd tell her all about our plan, naturally. Then she'd never go along with it, the sceptic persisted. The whole idea is preposterous. Don't be too sure, my friend, the ninth speaker broke in. We'd have to make her a tempting proposition. For instance, we could promise her as much time as she wants. And break our promise later, of course, said the sceptic. The ninth speaker gave an icy smile. Of course. He, he said, if we didn't mean what we said, she'd sense it at once. No, no, cried the chairman, banging the table. I couldn't agree to that. If we really gave her all the time she wanted, it would cost a fortune. Hardly that, the ninth speaker said blandly. How much time can one child consume, after all? True, it would be a minor drain to our resources, but think what we'd be getting in return. The time of everyone else in the world. Momo would consume very little, and the little she did consume would simply have to be charged to overheads. Consider the advantages, gentlemen. The ninth speaker resumed his seat, while everyone weighed the pros and cons. All the same, the sixth speaker said eventually, it wouldn't work. Why not? For one simple reason, I'm afraid, that the girl already possesses all the time she wants. There'd be no point in trying to bribe her with something she has plenty of. Then we'd have to deprive her of it first, the ninth speaker replied. We're talking in circles, chair, the chairman said wearily. The child's beyond our reach, that's the whole trouble. A sigh of disappointment ran the length of the boardroom table. May I venture a suggestion, asked the tenth speaker. The floor is yours, said the chairman. The tenth speaker gave the chairman a little bow before proceeding. This girl, he said, is fond of her friends. She loves devoting her time to others. What would become of her if there were no one left to share it with? She won't assist us in of she won't assist us of her free will. We must concentrate on her friends instead. He produced a folder from his briefcase and flipped it open. The principal persons concerned are named as Beppo Road Sweeper and Guido Guide. I also have a list of the children who play, pay her regular visits. I suggest we simply lure those people away so she can't get in touch with them. What will Momo's abundance of time amount to when she is all on her own? A burden, a positive curse. Sooner or later she won't be able to stand it any more. And when that time comes, gentlemen, we shall present her with our terms. I'll wager a thousand years to the microsecond that she'll show us the way, just to get her friends back. Downcast till now, the men in grey raised their ha heads. Every foe's face broke into a thin-lipped smile of triumph. Every pair of hands applauded. The sound reverberated along the interminable passages and corridors like an avalanche of stones rattling down a mountainside. Dun, dun, dun. That's the end of chapter 11. Join me next time for chapter 12. Hope Bye. you're enjoying. Take care. Lots of love. Bye for now.